to work out in regards to your salvation. Thanks for being here this morning. Um, it's sometimes tough after a long week. We get beat down by the world, and it's our turn to come here and recharge, you know, revitalize our souls and, you know, praise God and, and just be with people that have this, are on the same path, the same journey as we are. Uh, and that's because we live in an uncertain world. Isn't, it's amazing. Every time you turn around, what used to be true is now doubtful. That which used to be the norm is now rejected. It's just an upside-down world, isn't it? And it just seems it accelerates, and, and it's so hard to uh, acclimate to what is true and what is not true and what is to be expected of us and what's not to be expected. And your life just feels upside down, doesn't it? And, but that's life on this world. It's a life of uncertainty. And that means that you just can't be certain about a lot of things. And there's no real guarantees, are there, in life? I mean, there's no guarantees of how long you're going to live. There's no guarantees about the government, the economy. There's no guarantees about your health. There's just uncertainty. And life's about risk, isn't it? And the unknown. Oscar Wilde wrote, the essence, the very essence of romance is uncertainty. I imagine if you knew every time the guy's going to get the girl and the girl's going to get the guy, you wouldn't watch the movie. Well, oh, wait a second. They do anyway. You know, <laughs> But they create that remote romantic <clears throat> tension, <clears throat> excuse me, that romantic tension that will they fall in love or not? And it's when it all works out, you go, ah, oh. well, it's uncertainty. You can't escape it. Now, the, the downside of uncertainty, it, it really makes us feel un, are vulnerable, doesn't it? When you don't know for sure if something's going to work out or happen, it creates this uh, uh, vulnerability by yourself, and you feel, well, unstable. And because of that, people don't like things that are unstable, so they'll try to resolve that uncertainty. They'll try to do it quickly. Sometimes they'll, they'll run away. Sometimes they'll grab onto whatever information seems to fit their, their thank you very much, fits the, the scenario, even if it's bad information. Because we don't like unstable foundations, do we? We want things very clear, very precise. But yet, you know, life is full of uncertainty. And we have to discern the difference between probability and possibility. Now, what does that mean? Is it possible that the plane you uh, fly in it could crash? Is it very probable that will happen? No. One of the safest ways to travel. Is it possible the business you start will not succeed? It will fail and you'll be bankrupt. But is it probable? Well, the probability goes up because a lot of businesses do fail. What if we can't make the payments? People sometimes are so fearful of the possibility that they never step out and try anything. Is that not true? Buy a car, purchase their first home. When you were young and courting or wanting to find a life mate, what if she says no when I ask her out? Is that a possibility? Well, with some of us, the possibility is higher than others. <laughs> but, but if you let the possibility rule your life, you will never do anything. It paralyzes us, doesn't it? The, the uncertainty. It paralyzes from taking any action, from ever starting, ever beginning anything of noteworthy. But what if you knew for certain before you started how things were going to work out? Would that change things? Well, in the world, everything is uncertain. But when it comes to our relationship with God, the probability is always 100%. We can live a life of certainty. Now, constantly, I deal with people, and people express their doubts that they're going to heaven. And perhaps that's the saddest thing that a person can struggle with when they come to Christ. After all that God has done, they're just not sure they're going to make it. And that uncertainty does paralyze them. 
It fills them full of frustration and sometimes sadness and despair. And sometimes Satan will use it and magnify it so much they'll just quit altogether. You hear statements, well, I don't know if I'm good enough. I don't know if I have the strength to make it. And that uncertainty can drive them away from the Lord altogether. Well, we're here to change that. Because when you come to Christ, you come to understand one thing. You can know assuredly that you're going to heaven. That's what God came or sent Jesus down to a promise us. And that's what we're going to look at in this morning's lesson. And we're going to continue it, Lord willing, next week. And, but we're going to talk about the assurance you can have you're going to heaven. Because we already talked about, you know you can find Christ's church. You know there's just one. You can know you're part of his church. And now it's going to be very personal. You can know you're going to heaven without any doubt. And it has to deal with facts, faith, and feelings. And the text that I would draw your attention to is one in 1 John chapter 5, where John is writing, because this is not a new problem. He was dealing with people and Christians of the very first century. He says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of Jesus Christ, that you may know that you have eternal life, that you can have confidence. See, they were doubting. They were having issues with their faith or being confident, a life of certainty that they're going to heaven. So with that being said, let's look at this idea of fact, faith, and feelings. And what I mean by that, this is a title lesson has been put on a, a sermon from way hundreds of years ago. It's nothing new, but it's a way to describe really how we're supposed to order our things in our life, because God is very clear. And I want you to think of a train, because if you have an engine, and then you have the fuel car, the tinderbox, whether it's full of coal or wood, then you have maybe some, you know, but the last one here are pictures of caboose, right? The engine, the middle car, and the caboose. Now, does the caboose ever drive the train? It doesn't, see, who was that young kid that said that? Everyone can understand that with certainty. The caboose does not push the train. The engine pulls the train. But when we put some words on here, fact, faith, and feeling, do often feelings drive people's life? And there's the problem. I don't feel good enough to go to heaven. I don't feel like I'm saved. I don't... Now, feelings are important. We're not going to dismiss them. We just want to put them in the proper order. Because God is very clear about his order. It has to be facts first. And out of your facts comes your faith. And out of your faith, you should have some feelings. And so every now and then, they'll have someone, because they're trying to push more lottery sales, someone is uh, bought a lottery ticket, and they're checking their ticket against the numbers that were drawn the night before. They check them, they check them, and they get to the last number. And all of a sudden, they scream for joy. Where does that feeling come from? From the fact that their numbers matched the winning numbers, and now they're a millionaire. And so they believe that they can go down and cash that ticket in for all that money, right? And that creates that joy. And then you share it with your spouse, and the spouse says, I don't believe it. And what do they want? Give me the ticket, and then they do the same thing. They match them up. But when they see the fact is true, it produces a confidence, and then now they're ecstatic as well. Now, faith never determines facts, and yet that happens to a lot of people. Well, I believe. Well, it doesn't matter if you believe it or not. If it's not true, just because you believe it doesn't make it true. Facts drive our life. And we're going to see what facts are and how important they are. But we have to understand that this is the order that God had put it in. It's very clear. In John chapter 10, Jesus said this, If I don't do the works of my Father, don't believe me. But if I do them, don't believe me, what I say, but believe the works so you may know and understand 
The Father's in me and I in the Father. He said, look at the facts. If I did them, then have faith. Nicodemus came to Jesus by night in John chapter 3 and verse 2. And this is what he said. Rabbi, we know. We have confidence. We're certain that you have come from God. What made you so convicted of that? Because no one can do these signs unless God is with him. See, he looked at the facts of what Jesus was doing, the miracles, and that gave him the faith that he, he came from God. And so motions cannot and must not drive our facts, our engine. It does not determine, they do not determine our faith. Now, we have a problem with a feeling culture, don't we? When we look about uh, facts, we don't live in a culture that deals with facts very much. It's not really even about faith. It's really about feeling. Because it used to be in my parents' generation that they didn't express feelings a lot, did they? They were told that real men, well, don't cry. And I don't know if this was the norm, but my sister and I were just talking the other day about uh, our dad didn't hug a lot. He just didn't do that. He didn't tell me that he loved me very much. Very rarely would he tell me that. Now, mom was different. But he came out that great generation, had gone to war. When you buck up and you work hard, you don't show emotions. Now, today, our, this generation, everyone's nurtured and, and encouraged. Express all your emotions. Let everyone know how you feel. And it's our emotions that drive so much of our life today. And it drives the conversation. It drives the political agendas. It drives everything. And yet, God is very clear. It has to be facts first and not emotions. Now, not saying that emotions aren't important, but they can become very troublesome if they take over your life. Now, when we have our marriage classes, we talk about don't ever argue with someone's feelings. Because if your wife says... I'm cold. The last thing you need to do, husband, say, well, that's stupid. It's really warm in here. You know, if she feels cold, who are you to argue and say she's not cold? Because if she feels cold, guess what? She's cold. And you come across as an idiot if you say, no, it's not cold in here. And also, then she's going to feel like you don't love her. Now, if you feel like someone doesn't love you, then their faith is, and their fact they are going to live on is that you don't love me. Because feelings, after a while, become your reality. And if I tell myself over and over enough, I don't feel like he loves me. I don't feel like he doesn't. He doesn't, he doesn't love me. And feelings now become your facts, whether they're true or not. And that's the danger in our society. I feel smart, therefore I am. Boy, that gets a lot of people in trouble. You go to the doctor, and he tells you, I'm sorry, you've got two arteries that are plugged. You need to have bypass surgery immediately. And you reply, that can't be, because I feel fine. Has that ever happened? See, your feelings do not determine truth, even though we live in a feeling culture. We also have a faith-only culture. And what I mean by that, when it comes to spiritual things, we are living in a Christian environment where it's faith only, and don't confuse faith with facts or feelings. It's all about, if you've got faith, no matter what you believe, that's okay. It's your truth. Well, people can believe something, even passionately, but that doesn't mean what they believe is in fact true. It used to be a time in the Civil War era that when you were sick and they couldn't cure you or get you better, the do predominant medical view was is you had too much blood. Can you imagine that? So they'd say, you got too much blood, so we need to relieve you of some of that blood. So they would cut you and let the blood bleed out. Now they believed that to be true. That was a practice. Could it be any farther from the truth? Actually... We learn now that sometimes you need more blood, right? In that same era, in the Civil War, after the war was over and victory was won, and there was finally going to be peace between 
our country who the north battled with the south, sometimes Christian brother against Christian brother. It was such a terrible time in our history. But after the war was won, there's peace and people could finally go home. Wasn't that a wondrous time? That was the truth, right? But did you know there were people from both sides that did not get the news that the war was over and they still continued to live day by day as though the battle was on. They were hiding in the brush and the bushes, eating berries. They were estranged from their families. And when they see people that were the enemies, they would still engage them. Why? Because they believed the civil war was still being fought. And even when people come to try to tell them, it's over, the South lost, they're going to, no, I don't believe you. Isn't that sad? See, faith does not determine facts either. The only thing that determines your faith is the facts. And if we don't start with facts, the engine that drives our life, we're going to be derailed so many times and live, have a life of uncertainty. Now, does that all make sense? We looked at it in practical ways. We look at it in physical ways when it comes to our health. You can understand it's also true spiritually that God wants us to start with the facts of the case. And then that will produce faith. And then that will always bring about some type of feeling. So let's just ask the question then, what are, what are these things? What, what are we talking about? What are facts and faith? And what is our feelings? And we'll first start with facts. A fact is really something simple. It's that which is always true. Now, I'm not saying always has been true because sometimes new facts arise, like President Lincoln was shot. Is that a fact? Yes. It wasn't always true, but it's always true now, isn't it? Now, something about facts... They're true for everyone, or else they're not a fact. And we talk about mathematical facts, right? Two plus two is tr true all around the world. And that's what makes them so universal, and that's what makes them so, well, faith-producing, because they're certain, and you can build a foundation on them. Now, there's something about facts. It doesn't matter if you believe them or not. They're still true. And it doesn't matter if the majority accepts them or not. In fact, nobody could believe they're true, and they're still true. They're independent about anybody's acceptance because facts are authoritative. Now, I'll give you an example. There was a time that they thought that Earth was the center of our solar system until science proved it's not the Earth, but it's the sun, actually. But until that time, everybody believed that which was false. Now, did that make the sun the center of our solar system just because everyone taught that? No. They were teaching that which was wrong. But the fact was still out there. It's the sun. Now, we live in a culture today that says there is no God. That Christianity was written by a bunch of men. That it's full of lies. That same-sex marriage is okay. And the predominant view is those things are all true. But facts don't care about what people think. Facts just care about what is true. Facts are so important, so important, that God wrote a book of them. That's what this is. Jesus said, sanctify them in thy truth. Thy word is truth. What sets us apart from the world? What gives us direction? What gives us some kind of certainty? It's the truth. It's the truth that is found in here about physical things, about how we got here, what we're supposed to do while we're here, and where we're going. Let me give you an example. People say, well, man, my feelings, I just can't control them. And I, I just, here's a fact. In Genesis chapter 4, it's amazing how the Bible just deals with all the anatomy and the biology of our emotions, our spiritual being. Uh, Cain is very upset because God did not accept his sacrifice because he didn't offer correctly. So in uh, Genesis 4, in verse uh, 4, he says he became very angry and his countenance fell. He was depressed. Feelings, right? And so the Lord said to Cain, here's the fact. Why are you angry? Why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, 
Will not your countenance be lifted up? There's a fact. Your emotions are often tied to what you do. Because God has put in us a conscience. And when you do that which you know is wrong, you should feel sad. Because your facts are driving your emotions now. But when you do what is right based on facts, and you base your actions on it, you will feel better. Facts will drive your emotion, not the other way around. Now, how would you learn those things? Unless we read the Bible. So again, that's why we encourage people to read the Bible, not just so you can have academic knowledge, but so you can have a certain life full of certainty. You are living a life based on what is true, not what the world thinks it's true. John uh, 17, we already quoted that, and that leads us to the idea of faith then. Well, what's faith? Faith is simply a conviction. It's not a think so. It's not, I hope so. A faith says, I know so. Faith is conviction that something is true. And it always leads to a lifestyle that is based on that conviction. So in other words, if there's no change in behavior or lifestyle, then you really don't have a conviction or faith. We always live that which we believe to be true. For example... When you get in your car and you come down to uh, the stoplight and it turns yellow and it's just about ready to turn red, what do you do? All right, I know some of you hit the gas pedal. (laughs) I'm talking about the rest of us. What do you do? You hit that other pedal, right? And you hit that brake. What is your faith that caused you to hit that brake? That car is going to stop. Do you trust that brake to stop you? Yes, and it's all based on the facts about how it was designed and physics, whether you understand it or not, your personal experience, but those facts drive your faith, don't they? And that drives your action. Hit that brake, and I'm not scared of dying because I expect that car to stop me every time. Isn't that not true? And so that's what faith does. It's a conviction. I know this will happen, and so I'm going to base my life on it. Now, the word faith is so important, it's used some 450 times in the New Testament, the noun and the verb. God wants us to live a life of faith. Without faith, Hebrews 11, verse 6 says, it's impossible to please God. But everyone that comes to him must believe that he is, and you must be convicted that he'll reward you if you diligently seek him. But again, feelings don't produce faith. Faith is going to produce a feeling. And faith does not produce facts. The only authoritative thing is the facts that God has given us. So a lot of people are adamant about their faith. And they think, well, just because I believe it, therefore it's true. That's not the case. And so we all should question, where does my faith come from? And that's why we read that text that is so imperative. Romans chapter 10 and verse 17. So faith cometh by hearing and hearing the word of God. I know it because God said it. And that settles it. And that's the engine that drives my life. So what are feelings in? Feelings are an emotional state or reaction whether they're rational or not. Now, I have to put irrational because can people have feelings that are irrational? Well, of course, it happens all the time. But true facts that produces faith should always result in the proper emotions. And if there are no emotions, then you have to question whether you really have the faith. For example... Someone gets the terrible news, there was an accident, and you find out that your loved one died. Should that produce an emotion? Well, certainly. And if it doesn't, you would wonder what is wrong in that relationship. There was a basketball player, South Carolina, uh, uh, basketball was playing North NC State, and one of the players fell on the floor, his heart stopped yesterday for three minutes. Three minutes. And they had to do CPR, use the uh, shockers, 
And the coach called the mother who was four and a half hours away. And she got home late and turned the TV on. And she saw a guy lay on the floor. And it hadn't been determined which player it was. And she had to wait and wait. And finally they said it was her son. Do you think that produced the emotion? And she had to drive four hours to get there to be with him in the hospital. He's alive now, conscious and doing well. But his heart had stopped for three minutes. That was a fact. The faith was that if he didn't get resuscitated, he would die. And now it produced an emotion in her. You can imagine that. But sometimes the emotion's joy, isn't it? Sometimes it's happiness. It's when the man asks the woman, will you marry me? And she says, yes, you will. And there's great joy. When a baby's born, and it's, it's a boy, it's a girl, and it's healthy, there's great joy. And there should be great joy when you and I know we're going to heaven. Even though we live in an uncertain world, there's something that is certain that I don't care what happens down here, I know that I'm going to heaven. So how can you be so certain? Because the facts that produce my faith, that gives me such confidence and joy. So let's talk about real briefly just some facts to build on, and then we're going to expand on them, Lord willing, next week. Because I'm just introducing this concept. Your life has to be driven on the facts of God's word. And you may have to have a conviction they're true because God made them and it's impossible for him to lie. And when you have a faith based on that, it's going to change your whole life, your whole personality, your whole demeanor. You're going to have joy rather than despair. You're going to have happiness rather than sadness. There's going to be a, 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 a what is that, a skip in your step. That's what I was trying to say. Let me just share four things. And they're just universal, we know them, but it's never inappropriate to talk about them again. First of all, the fact. Mariano, we were watching um, NFL game, and it used to be behind the end zone on extra points. You would see this sign every time, and he, he saw it because I hadn't seen it for a long time, and it was someone holding up what? John 3.16. And uh, he saw it, and he goes, God, it is great that someone's got it there. And we know that verse. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes on him should not perish but have eternal life. There's a fact. And you might not understand why he loves you. And you might question, well, I don't think I'm worthy of love. That's thinking. Those are feelings. And your feelings are driving your faith and their faith is producing your own facts. But the truth it is, when it's all said and done, and you need to tell yourself this, I have to tell myself, God loves me more than I can even understand. He loves me. Well, I don't feel lovely or worth loving. Oh, see, there's a feeling word. It's not about what you feel that determines whether God's going to love you or not. He loves you, and he proved it by having his only son die for you. We have to wrestle with that. And the only conclusion is like, wow, I guess he does. I guess I'm lovable after all. There's something I can look forward to. Well, let's couple that with this then. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We read that in Romans chapter 3 in verse 23. When Paul's trying to get people to see that we all need a Savior... And this is important because it's going to dismiss so many false feelings that people have. All have sinned, verse 23, and fall short of the glory of God. And we're justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Now, a lot of people say, I don't know if I need to become a Christian because I'm a good person. I don't feel like I'm lost. I don't, I, I feel like I do live a good life. Now notice how they're leading the discussion with the word feel, or I think. The truth is what? All have sinned, and everybody falls short of who God is. So what does that mean? Well, Romans 6 says in the next couple chapters away, verse 23, 
For the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ the Lord. Now, a lot of people say this. I don't feel like I'm good enough to go to heaven. And what's the fact of the case? That's true. You're not. Because all have sinned. Everybody falls short of the glory of God. Everybody. And that leaves nobody out. Because here's God and here are you down here. You have fallen short. You're not worthy. And that's what he's saying. And then because of that, you're going to perish. It's like you're in the ocean after the Titanic went down. And you're going to die because you're in the water. And when you're in sin, you will perish because God cannot have a relationship with a sinner. We're all in trouble. It doesn't matter if you feel like you're a good person or not. We're all going to perish. That's a truth. And until we own that fact, it's not going to drive us to Christ, the need for a Savior. A lot of people feel like they're okay, but the truth is they're not. But here's the good news. God has done everything necessary. To save you and get you to heaven. That's grace. Grace is God doing for you what you could not do for yourself. So you're in the water. The Titanic is now floating to the bottom of the ocean. It's cold. There's icebergs in the water. And you're feeling yourself get numb. And finally you see, some, or hear a whistle. Someone's blowing. And it's one in a lifeboat. And they're coming around trying to find survivors. And with your last bit of energy, you raise your hand and you go, oh, I'm here. That person comes over and they grab you and pull you into the boat. Who saved who? Did you save yourself? No. It's thank you, thank you, thank you. And God loved you so much. He sent his son to save you. He said, here, come to me, and I'll put you in my church, and I'll save you forever. What can I do? Nothing. It's a free gift. Is what Romans chapter 6, verse 23. Free means what? Now, we'll have to talk next week how to accept the gift, how to whistle and say, here am I. But God has done everything, and it's a free gift to those who believe. Now, let's just deal with this... Uh, feeling that people say, I don't think I'm good enough. I don't think I've done enough. Or I think I've done too many bad things. I'll just share with you one passage about this, and it's 1 Timothy chapter 1, where Paul speaks about himself, and he calls himself the chief of sinners, because he tried to kill Christians, destroyed the church, and God's very plan to save the world. He begins with this. It is a trustworthy statement. 1 Timothy 1, verse 15. A trustworthy statement. This is a fact. Deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came in the world to save sinners. That's first. And second, among whom I'm foremost or chief of all. When it comes to the list of sinners, you don't put Hitler at the top. You don't put other people. Who do you put? Paul says, I am the top sinner. And that means if you feel bad, you should feel bad for your sin, but you are ranked below who? Paul. So take some comfort in that. All right? You're not as bad as he is. He said this is a trustworthy statement. And yet for this reason, I found mercy. In order that in me, as the chief or the foremost, Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience and as an example for those who would believe. In him for eternal life. So what is Paul saying? As the chief, if God can save me, guess what? He can save you. You're never good enough. That's the point. God's going to do the saving for you. And when he saves you, you are saved through and through. And you can know for certainty you're going to heaven because it's not based on what you didn't do or did do. It's what God did for you. And that's why we have a life of joy. And that's why we have a life of certainty and hope and expectation. 
and we're not weighed down by this world and we're not, we're not swayed to follow the world because we've got a direction we're going and, and don't bother me with this stuff of the world because I'm going to heaven. Don't weigh me down. Don't distract me. Don't get me off course. I'm going to live with Jesus. And since you know it's true, it gives you this stamina, this energy that you can't have without the facts that drive your faith that produces those kind of feelings. So we're all done. And it takes us back to where we start, where John wrote this. I wrote these things so that you can what? Know you have eternal life. You can know assuredly in an uncertain world of one thing, you're going home to heaven. You say, well, how does that apply to me? Come back next week and we'll talk about that in some specific detail. But those are the facts of the case. Would you believe it? If you believe it, you'll act on it. Because faith has to produce some action or it's really not faith at all. And when you come out of those waters of baptism, having Christ, having washed away all your sins and added you to his family, written your name in the book of life, you're going to have a feeling of peace and joy you've never experienced before. If we can help you, won't you come as we stand and sing, when I've gone the last mile of the way.